Tonight we're going to continue uh, in Brother Clay's absence in the series that we've been doing over the uh, course of the last several Sunday nights called The Basics of Our Faith. And I'm excited to dive into this lesson tonight because it intersects so uh, many different areas that I'm working in right now. Um, we're going through a series on Wednesday nights with our students called uh, Does My Life Matter? Uh, on Common Grounds, our 20-something Bible study on Tuesday nights, we're walking through the book of Acts. And, uh, and in my school, um, I'm working on new member assimilation, how to get new members in and, and get them to stick. And the lesson tonight is kind of a summary of all of those different things that are really going on in my life. And this topic tonight is something that I've been chewing over, wrestling over, and I think it's something uh, that we all can do a better job in. And the title is, Becoming a Church Member Who Makes a Difference. All of us want to make a difference in our life. All of us want our lives to matter. There's not a single person on the earth who wants to live a life of insignificance, or one that doesn't matter, one that nobody knows anything about. We all want to make our mark on the world, and hopefully, as Christians, we want to make our impact for the kingdom of God. We want the few years that we lived on this earth to make an eternal impact, to make some ripple effects into eternity. For whenever we reach the finish line and go before our Creator, He can say to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. We want our life to matter. We want to be a church member who makes a difference. Kind of thinking about this idea in this lesson, I've just kind of thought about my own life and all of the different people throughout my life who have made a difference in shaping and impacting me. And you can probably think in your own life as well, all of the people who influenced you, they got you to where you are. No one of us, not a single one out there, is sitting here tonight because of work that you did on your own. We have all had people who have invested in us. We have all had people who believed in us, even when there were times we didn't believe in ourselves, who gave us resources and tools, who challenged and encouraged, who uh, spoke conviction into our lives whenever we needed that word of truth, but was also there to help us whenever we failed or whenever we needed just words of encouragement. We've all had people like that in our lives. And I'm so thankful that throughout my life, I've had so many godly men and women who have poured into my life and have helped me make a difference. But as we're kind of looking at this topic of the foundations of the faith and um, the basics of the faith and these things that how can we kind of get back to the basics, back to the fundamentals and thinking, how can my life make a difference in the lives of others? I thought there's no better place to go than, than really the start of the New Testament church in the book of Acts. When you see the, the church of Acts really begin, the New Testament church begin, you see so many just mind-blowing things that the world has never seen start to happen. God, through Jesus, gives the commission in Acts 1-8 to once the Holy Spirit gives them power there to be His witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. And then we see the rest of the book of Acts them following through in that commission. We see at the day of Pentecost that they received the power of the Holy Spirit. They were able to evangelize and share the gospel to people in languages they did not know where they could understand and they were able to respond to the gospel. And then we get to the section heading where we're going to be at tonight in Acts 2, 41 through 47. And in my Bible, it talks about a generous and growing church. And I think that is a church that all of us want to be a part of, right? One that would be um, explained or summarized as a generous and growing church. But in order for a church to be considered a generous and growing church, it must be made up of individual members who are willing to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Uh, if you look at the back of your sheet, I provided... I, I, try to as, as much as I can, and if you didn't get a green sheet, we have people who could get you one. I try to kind of keep my finger on the pulse of culture and try to study what is going on, uh, where are people at in the range, because I don't want to ever speak to uh, answer questions that aren't being asked or make generaliz generalizations that aren't there. But in studying this idea of making a difference, and we're a church that 
uh, highly believes in evangelism. We saw that through our faith reports. You didn't see that through the Across the Street ministry, our Testify ministry, our WMU ministry, our men's ministry, all these different ministries that we have to where we seek to intersect people's lives with the gospel. And I found it interesting that we all believe or we all want to make a difference in people's lives. And Barna did a study of really the gauge on uh, how do people uh, respond best to the gospel. And so if you look at the statistics there, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but the highest statistic on what people would be open to, and if you're trying to like go down and tally up the numbers and you're like, this doesn't equal 100%, it's because they asked each specific group the one question and then that's the percentage out of 100 then the second question is the percentage out of 100 so it's a different type of data than maybe you're used to receiving but they asked what are you more open to and so non-believers you have two different categories you have those who believe that spiritual things matter in life but they don't attend church and then you have people who say really spirituality is not that big of a deal for me and I don't attend church and they asked them these same questions and you see that both of those categories, the highest form of evangelism that they said that they would be willing to receive was first one-to-one -one evangelism, and then second evangelism into groups, where they would be comfortable with a small group of people talking to them about faith or the things of Jesus. But then what I, what I thought was interesting is, those people said that the thing that they would be most willing to receive is first one-to-one -one evangelism which we're trying to do right now through the power of one and then second small group evangelism which we try to do through all of our different outreach ministries less than 25 percent I think the percentage there is 22 percent had actually ever experienced one-to-one -one or small group evangelism which breaks my heart that means that people who are lost and who are not involved in the things of God or they're not attending church where they can hear the gospel, not only are they somewhat interested, uh, you know, high percentage, a fourth of them even interested, they would be willing to consider it. If they were going to consider it, that's what they would consider the most. But they're not even, they're not even intersecting with these different things. There was another statistic that I thought was kind of um, sobering, if you will. And that was 96% of millennials believe that part of their faith means being a witness about Jesus, which I think all of us would agree with, right? If we were to say, if you are going to say, I'm a Christian, does that not involve you being a witness to the things of Jesus? If one word that is continually repeated in the book of Acts is the word witness. They continually say, these are things that we witnessed. We saw these things happen. That's one thing I love about Christianity, is because you might be able to argue with me about the historical accuracy, accuracy of the Bible, but you can't argue with me about what's happened in my life, what I have witnessed the Holy Spirit do in and through my life. You can't argue with that. And I have witnessed God do some tremendous, only can be God things in my life. There have been experiences in my life where if I had any question or doubt where, whether God was real, he definitely revealed himself to me in those moments, unlike anything I've ever experienced before. So 96% of millennials who are those born in 1984 to 1988, they would say that it is important for you to be a witness about Jesus. But this next statistic is the one that I think should hit us close. So while 96% believe it's important, 47% of millennials believe it is wrong to share your personal beliefs with someone of a different faith. Almost half, almost half of those born between 1984 and, or 1984 and 1998 believe it's wrong for you to evangelize and share the gospel. And it's not just millennials that believe this. Gen X, 1965 to 83, 22%, almost one in four believe the same thing. Boomers, 46 to 64, 9%. And then elders who are, are those born before 1946, 11%. So no matter what age bracket that you're in, there are people who believe that it's wrong for us as believers to share the gospel of Jesus with people of a different faith or people who are unbelieving. And so for us to kind of think about how do we make a difference, we have to start understanding 
what even believers in the faith have different than us when it comes to how they share the gospel with other people. Because I think that we can become uh, complacent or we can just become used to what God is doing in our church that we miss out on really how much God is moving among us. We, we become so used to all of the different things that God affords us and he blesses us with that we just become used to it. And so we, we miss out on the fact that there are not very many churches, if really any, doing the evangelistic push and outreach that our church does. The emphasis, the day-to-day grind in making sure that people's lives intersect the gospel. And so in that, if we start taking for granted all of the different ways God is allowing us to be used, then we're not going to make a difference. We're not going to make an impact. So how can we look back at the book of Acts? How can we look back at the New Testament church and not get into that mindset of, oh, somebody else is going to do that? That's, that's the church's job to do that. That's not my personal job to do that. Oh, people know our church is here. Our church has is, is been around for 170 plus years. They know about First Baptist Church. If they wanted to come to church, they would come. How do we get out of that, that mindset? How do we continue to think, how can I do more? How can my life make a difference? Well, I think these verses and acts show us really three things tonight that we're going to look at on our lives making a difference. So if you will join with me, Acts 2, 41 through 47. This is right after the day of Pentecost. Peter preaches a sermon, and this is right after he calls them really to repentance. And it says this, So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about 3,000 people were added to them. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. And then fear came over everyone, and many Wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and held all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and uh, distributed the proceeds to all as anyone had a need. And every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the the temple complex. They broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with a joyful and humble attitude and praising God and having favor with all people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. So like I said, we're going to see three things tonight on this idea of becoming a church member who makes a difference. The first thing we see is the devotion to grow. Now I realize that your listening sheet says decision. So you just strike that right above devotion. The guy who edited it probably should have made sure that the words were right before he printed 280 copies. So just strike through that devotion, (laughs) the devotion to grow. So we see this word used twice, that the New Testament church was devoted. They were loyal. They wanted to not only say, yes, we're Christ followers. Yes, we're a part of this new church. But they wanted to show the apostles, they wanted to show their church leaders that we're going to be committed to this. This isn't something that we are just going to claim by name only and then not let it impact or permeate our lives. We're going to allow what we claim with our mouth to impact the actions of how we live, not just once or twice a week, but every single day. So how did they do this? Well, they did it in a couple ways. The first way we see is that they wanted to grow deeper in knowledge. It says that they set under the apostles' teachings. They wanted to learn. They wanted to grow. You've probably experienced this. It doesn't really matter what area of life it is. If you ever become interested in something and something just really catches your attention, you start doing research on it, right? You want to watch movies about it. You want to watch television about it. You want to read books about it. You want to look it up on the internet. You just get really intrigued. It's almost like when you're on Facebook and you see like a video that pops up about something and you click on it and then all the suggested videos come after it and next thing you know you've been watching these videos for like two hours and you're like, what have I done with my life? Why do they keep showing all of these same type of videos? Like the America's Got Talent videos are the ones that always get me because I'm not musically talented or like 
have some kind of crazy skills. So like when they show these and I get sucked into those videos, next thing I know I've watched just over and over and over about them. Or like the videos of the one where like they reunite a military person with their family. Like I could watch those videos like all day. When you become interested in something, then you devote time to wanting to know more about it, to learn about it. You dive into it. I know that one thing about me sharing my faith, especially whenever I was younger, was I was nervous to go out and talk to people about my faith because I just feel like I didn't know enough about it. And so a lot of times people give that an excuse as to, well, I can't join across the street ministry or I can't join faith evangelism. I can never be a Sunday school teacher or a leader because I just don't know enough. And I'm going to be honest with you. This area is something that I study and think about every day, and you can never exhaust the knowledge of God. You will never know enough to where you feel like you have mastered this. But one thing that we see from the New Testament, early New Testament churches, even though they didn't know it all, they were willing to try to sit and learn as much as they could. They sat under these men that they respected who were leaders, and they said, just teach us how we can be like you. We're not going to just be intimidated by the lack of knowledge, but we want to know more. So you got to learn that for yourself. How can I make a difference? Well, how do you learn? What do you do? I like, I have to scratch things down. Like if I have a thought that enters my mind and I tell myself, oh, I'm going to remember that later, I'm not. 100% of the time, if I don't write it down immediately, that thought will never enter my mind again. Maybe at like 2 a.m., like two weeks from now, it'll pop in my head. But, like, when I actually need it, it's gone if I don't write it down. Like, people who see my Bible, like, I have years of sermons in post-it notes in the back of my Bible because if, if like, God impresses on me a thought, if I don't scratch it down, like, I keep blank post-it notes in the front of my Bible because I have to write it down. Like, I didn't have one the other day, and my sermon is on my jury duty envelope <laughs> that was sent out. Because if I didn't write it down, I wouldn't be able to be standing before you tonight. Like, whatever it takes for you to learn, like, learn that. And whatever hindrances and obstacles that you have, don't give up because of it. Like, one thing that Brother Clay talked about in Faith Basic was that one reason that people don't want to share their faith is they don't feel like they can memorize an outline. Well, for me, I know that memorizing stuff is difficult so like I said I write it down over and over and over like in college like at union whenever I was trying to study stuff I just had sheets of printer paper with Greek words written over and over and over just trying to remember you have this dedication you have this devotion God I know that you're calling me to do this and so instead of making excuses on why I can't I'm going to try to grow deeper in my knowledge of you You know, there's never a time in the Bible that God calls somebody who is already just knows it all and can do it all. Every single person, it seems like God calls, they first try to answer with some kind of excuse on why they can't do it. Well, God, I just, I'm not very good in my speech. I I just, I can't talk. How, How could I talk in front of Pharaoh? Moses, he just didn't think he could do it. God, I'm just a youth. How, how could you possibly use me? God, I'm just, and fill in the blank, you have that excuse. You know what you've been telling God these past few years, maybe days. You know God has laid somebody on your heart. The power of one, for instance. Well, God, I know I turned that name in, but I'm just, who knows? What if they, what if they don't respond? Or what if I've reached out to them and they rejected me or they said they would and they didn't actually come or, or whatever? The first way to be devoted is we have to continue to grow deeper, deeper in our knowledge. The second is, that they grew closer in fellowship, closer in fellowship. It says that they did what they could to meet often. It, it uses in the Bible daily because they not only wanted to grow deeper in their faith, but they wanted to grow closer to people like them so that they could encourage one another, so that they could equip one another, so that they could strengthen one another each and every day. We so many times like to, um, I guess, make the figures in the Bible larger than life, that we forget that they were everyday people just like you and I. They had their own struggles. And the New Testament church, even more than now, because we've been established for thousands of years, they had struggles because you will see in the later parts of uh, 
later parts of Acts, even the religious ones, really pounded down hard on the New Testament church, trying to say that what they were doing was heretical and all of these different things. And if they didn't grow and connect close in fellowship, you know, Satan doesn't try to necessarily attack from the outside when it comes to God's church. He attacks from within. And what he tries to do is make you think that you can't trust the people sitting next to you in this fight. You know, we, we don't fight or battle with flesh and blood. You know, talk, you talk about that. But our, our battle is, is spiritual warfare. But just think about it like somebody who goes to war. You're only as good as the people beside you on that line when the, the shots come firing in, right? And if you can't trust those around you to protect you, then, then how are you going to succeed once you enter the battlefield? The same is true with you and I. If we don't trust the people sitting in this room to have our back when Satan attacks us, to pick us up when we fall down, if we can't be people willing to be, like, if we can't be people that people can trust, then really what are we doing here? If we can't connect deeper in fellowship, then how can we expect people to want to be devoted to doing the things of God with us and through our church? It blows my mind that God would want to use somebody like me, even though he knows all of my faults, all my fears, every time I've failed him. But yet he still, for whatever reason, wants to use me. And one of the greatest ways that I've seen is him connecting me with people who encourage me, even though they don't even know what I'm struggling with or going through. And that's the beautiful thing about biblical community is that God didn't call us to be silo Christians. He didn't call us to be alone. He didn't call us to be an island or isolated. He called us to do this in community. That's why I love that we have all of these different opportunities for us to join together as a church on not only our corporate times of Sundays and Wednesdays, but throughout the week to grow in our faith, to grow in these different areas to encourage. And so that's how we saw the New Testament church. They went deeper in knowledge, cl closer in fellowship, and then stronger in their faith. We saw that they, they learned different scripture, but then it says they joined together in prayer. And I think one of the first things that we need to do if we, if we say, God, I want my life to make a difference, is we have to go before him on our knees, humble and say, God, how are you going to use me? God, why would you want to use somebody like me? I think one of the most dangerous places we can get is if we start believing we deserve for God to use us. None of us deserve to be used by God. But yet he uses broken vessels to be used by him. But the only way you can grow stronger in that faith is to come before him in a humble heart so he can lead you deeper in that. And so the first thing we see in this idea of how do I become a church member who makes a difference, it is that we are devoted to grow. The second thing we see is the demonstration to give. The demonstration to give. One thing about the church being... Uh, categorized or explained as a generous and growing church is, and you, two verses really explain or summarize what was going on here. And yet, reading just those two verses, you're like, man, I wish I was a part of that church. Or man, I wish I could have seen what happened in that church because I just, I would like to talk to somebody when I get to heaven who was involved in that church because I would love to see after 3,000 people come to know Jesus, you somehow join together in houses under religious persecution daily, trying to raise your kids, trying to provide for your family, trying to get clean drinking water, all of the different hurdles and hiccups and hang-ups that they had to go through, and yet they devoted themselves and demonstrated that they were willing to be generous and to give. They're described by selling their possessions, distributing property, providing meals for people. I mean, it just, it's, it's a tremendous thing to see that they went from a religion that was just telling people they were going to hell and there was nothing they could do to be right in God's eyes to showing a 180 boom, you can now have a relationship with God. And it was, it's just phenomenal that these people were able to, to make a change so quickly. But they demonstrated. They lived out their faith. When people saw them, it says that uh, 
they had a humble attitude, praising God, and it says that they had favor with all people. Do you think they could have had favor with all people if they didn't have some kind of life change? If they weren't demonstrating out, if they weren't living out this faith that they believed in, do you think that all people, it didn't just say that their fellow believers they had good favor with, it says that all people, and we see that even later in Acts, like even the religious people who were upset that Peter and all the apostles were teaching about Jesus, they were like, we really can't say that they did anything wrong. Like, when they healed the lame man, they're like, we can't say he didn't heal the guy who was lame because here he is standing. Like, we can't say that God didn't work, but we don't like it. And when God demonstrates his love through us, people aren't going to like it, but they're not really going to have anything to say about it because they're like, it, it's here. They're, they're loving. They're more loving than they were before. They're more gracious than they were before. They have more joy in their life. They have a peace that I can't explain. Demonstrated, flowing out of them. It, it was almost like second nature. They weren't even trying. They met Jesus, and their life was changed. They met Jesus, and they couldn't help but live out what it meant to be a Christ follower. So how did they demonstrate this giving? Well, first they acknowledged the source. It says in verse 43 that fear came over everyone, and many signs and, uh, and wonders were performed. One of the key themes throughout the whole book of Acts, but especially at the beginning, is the power of the Holy Spirit. Time and time and time again, the Bible relates back to the power of the Holy Spirit and how this third person of the Trinity really worked through the New Testament church. And so for the New Testament church to acknowledge the source of our power, the fact that 3,000 people just gave their life to Jesus, it wasn't Peter who did that. It was God who did that. They acknowledge that the growth that was happening, that the good things, the blessings that were happening were not by any strategy that they did. It wasn't by any uh, clever whatever. It was the working of the Holy Spirit and them just being obedient to what God was calling them to do. And a temptation for us when things start going well in our life is to try to steal the glory from God. We see just later in the book of Acts, you have this husband and wife who sell this land, and they, they give the land to the church. It would be a very admirable thing to do. If they were a Baptist, they would probably have a whole wing of the church building named after them. But we see that they lied about how much they sold the land for, and they were struck dead right there in front of everybody. And it then later says that fear fell over the congregation. We can understand fear falling under the congregation when people are struck dead for lying to the Holy Spirit, right? But the issue there was an issue that they didn't allow to happen here. And the issue there was that Ananias, he wasn't trying to steal money from God. What he was trying to steal from God was his glory. And here, when we see that the New Testament church was generous and growing, it was because they gave glory to where glory was due. And if we, as First Baptist Church, want to continue growing, if you, as a church member, want to be a church member who makes a difference, then you've got to give glory where glory is due. It is God and God alone for the reasons that you have received the blessings that you've received. That The fact that we can come in here tonight and worship like we worship is because of a blessing of God because of the opportunities that you have at your work or in your family. It's not anything that we did. We have to acknowledge the source. But not only did they acknowledge the, the source, but they focused on the significant. They focused on what was significant. It says that they held everything or all things in common. You know, that normally happens, right, whenever you join in church together that everybody just always gets along and agrees, right? No, that doesn't happen. And really, that's not what happened here. It wasn't that they gave their life to Jesus and suddenly they became brainwashed to think the same way. They probably still had differing views on, so you're telling me that the Gentiles can now be saved? So you're telling me that it doesn't necessarily mean I have to follow, follow all of these religious rules and practices that we've been following for the last thousand years? Like, I'm sure that there were still some theological and social differences going on in this New Testament church. 
But we see that they weren't focused on that. What they were focused on is this. <laughs> we met Jesus, and our life was changed. And everything else is just secondary matters. We met Jesus, and our life was changed. And we're not going to let anything else make us uh, break in our unity. We're not going to let Satan try to come in and split us up, cause dissension. Because, again, Satan doesn't attack from the outside. He attacks within. He tries to break up your trust in the person sitting beside you. He tries to make you focus more on your social or political standing rather than do you know Jesus and has he changed your life? And if we focus on these secondary or tertiary or issues that are even farther down the line and we don't focus on the fact that God has called us to be unified through him and his gospel, then we're not going to be able to demonstrate the giving that God wants us to have. If we don't acknowledge the source, focus on what is significant, and then thirdly, prepare to support. One thing that I had been around my entire life, but I never understood until I step, truly like stepped into ministry, is the, the, I guess, how much you get your hands dirty in ministry, for better use of the term, with lack of other words. My whole life, I've been around ministry. I grew up in church my, my entire life. My dad was a deacon. My mom was a secretary at the church. I was a part of our church nine months before I was born. Every time the doors were open, most of the time when the doors weren't. And I saw my parents serve when the crowds were there, and I saw my parents be the only two left in the building trying to clean up when everybody else was gone. Like, I saw ministry and ministry happen, and I even saw the behind the scenes of ministry that, that most church members don't ever see. So I thought whenever I surrendered to the ministry right before college that I kind of knew what I was getting into. But I can't even begin to explain when you actually give your life to Jesus and say, God, I'm willing to um, go on behalf of other people and try to help them grow in their faith. The, the amount of support that people need emotionally and financially and spiritually and really the weight that sometimes comes down on your shoulders as you try to lead. And it's not just as a staff member. You probably have seen this through your Sunday school or through different um, outreach opportunities. Just there are a lot of people in our world, a lot of people in our community who have a lot of, um, a lot of you know, baggage that they carry with them. And one job that we have as a church and as church members is we're called to support them. But the thing is we can't do it alone. And the thing is, we can't truly do ministry without diving into those issues with them. Getting our hands a little bit dirty. It's not sitting in a pew, it's not sitting in an office and just expecting things will get done. But it's rolling up our sleeves and saying, I'm going to be willing to step out. I'm going to demonstrate that I'm willing to give not only my money in the offering, or my support, or my praise, and clap God. God, thank you for doing that. But I'm going to go out and I'm going to do these things. I'm going to give support where support is needed. And I'm going to step up and lead where God is calling me to lead because God has called each and every one of us to be leaders. We are supposed to lead others as we follow him. And so we have to have a devotion to grow. We have to have a demonstration to give. And finally, we have to have the decision to go. The decision to go. One thing I think is so cool is that we see in the first part of the verses that they sat under the apostles' teaching, fellowship, breaking bread, and prayer. And then we see at the end of the chapter that they were meeting together individually in their own homes, teaching, breaking bread together, and praying. They didn't just sit under their spiritual leaders like a sponge and soak it all in and then not give anything out. They took what they learned and then they went and applied it to their daily lives. They learned we're supposed to be teaching these things, we're supposed to be living in community, and we're supposed to be praying for one another. And then they modeled that every single day in the life that they lived, in their homes and in their houses. They decided, they made the decision, I am going to go with what I've learned. And we before us today, tonight, we have this same decision. But the temptation of what we can do or what can start to spring up inside of us are questions like this. Well, do I really have to do that? 
like, do I really, do I really, ha- like, I'm already involved in Sunday school. I already come, I'm here on Wednesday night, Ryan. I'm here on Sunday night. What else do you want from me? Like, nope, like, remember the building this morning. The, the balconies were full. The bottom was full. Children's church, nursery. I mean, the building was full. And then look around. I'm one of the devoted. Like, I'm here on Sunday night. Like, do I really have to do these other things? And when we start getting complacent, and when we start getting in a place where we are going to stop making a difference for Jesus, is when we get to the place of thinking about ministry as have to, instead of get to. I find myself, I mean, I'm going to be very transparent, I find myself sometimes asking, do I really have to do that? Because it can be tiring. Life is so tiring. My schedule is so crammed, packed, full that I'm like, do I really, God, are you really, do I have to give up this? Do I have to do this? And God convicts me so much. You don't have to do it. I can get somebody else to do it, but I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity. If you're going to be obedient, I'll allow you to be a part of the work I'm doing. And he's saying the same thing to you. No, you don't have to do it. If you want to miss out on the blessing of what God has in store for your life no he is not going to force you to live for him he's not going to force you to make the decision to go but the crazy thing is that he extends the hand and he allows you to be a part of his kingdom work that he's doing right here in henderson county right here in first baptist lexington you don't have to be a part of anything but you get to and so part of this decision to go is changing your mindset changing your thought pattern of Man, God is allowing me to do this. And another thing is, another temptation is, man, are we just doing too much? Like, look how many outreach opportunities our church has. Like, we're really, we're doing too much. And the thing is, that shows us we've lost a sense of urgency. If we were in a boat, and a hole, a leak sprung in the middle, and we're trying to get to land, and the boat is being filled with water, somebody went and say, hey, are we not dumping water out of this thing fast enough? Like, couldn't we kick back and take a nap for a second? No, we would be like, what can I take in our shoes off trying to scoop this water out as fast as we can? Because we see that if we don't, we're not going to be able to reach the destination like we want to. Or if we do, everybody with us isn't going to do it because maybe they can't swim as good as I can or whatever. We have so many people, the boat is sinking. We don't know how much time we have left on this earth. And there's people in our life, there are people that we're coming in contact with, and if we're not willing to share the gospel to them, if we're not willing to have a sense of urgency, they might not hear the gospel. We have people a rock throw from our church. We could walk out into the back parking lot and see their house. And we have made faith evangelism visits to people. We can see their house from our back parking lot. They couldn't tell you what John 3.16 said. They couldn't tell you what it takes to go to heaven. And they are less than 500 yards from our church property. It's not that we have too many things going on. It's that we don't have enough people stepping up and deciding, I want to make a difference with my life. We would never have to have people serve more than one week in the nursery or one week in children's church. We would never have to reformulate faith evangelism teams or wonder what across the street ministry is doing if everybody just stepped stepped up and did a little bit of their part you would have to be asking angela i haven't served in the nursery in six months like when can i get back in there and hold a baby again like i guarantee she's amen and over here please sign up and help me but it's true if we said you know i truly believe that investing in the next generation means helping out some of these guests that are coming in that I'm going to give up one Sunday a month, one Sunday a year, to do my part. You know what? I might not be comfortable with faith evangelism or across-the-street ministry, but I want my life to make a difference. So I'm going to stop allowing my excuses to stand in the way of what God could be doing through me. Whatever ministry it is, whatever outreach opportunity it is, fill in the blank. But I promise you, if ever in your mind the temptation is to blame the church for doing too much, the problem is not with the church. The problem is not with the gospel. The problem is with our attitudes and our hearts. And Satan will do that. He will will allow our religiousness to get in the way of what God's doing. If you don't think that's the case, look two chapters ahead. When they healed the lame man, this guy who's been laying for 40 years not being able to walk, 
And Peter heals him through the power of the Holy Spirit. And what do the religious people do? They complain about it. And how many times do we see that? We see life change through Jesus happen. And people complain. Because they have to move seats. Because the building is more full. They don't have their parking spaces like they had before. Who stood in the way of the person who was paralyzed when when the four men had to cut a hole through the roof to get to Jesus to heal their friend? Who was standing in the way? Religious people wanting to hear Jesus. If we allow our religiousity, our religiousness, our following the rules, our just doing what we've always done to impact our lives more than we allow Jesus to impact our lives, we'll stop making a difference for him. So my question is this. What are you going to do tonight to become a church member who makes a difference for the kingdom of God?